Walk to my car. I, I can't do it. Walk. I, I can't. My leg's broken. Walk. I, walk! I don't care if your leg's broken. You're going to walk. I can't walk, dude. Hold on. You're going to walk. My leg's broken. I just got thrown off the fucking balcony. You didn't get thrown off. You I, jumped off. I saw you close the door. I, and you told me you jumped. Come on. I, I, dude, my whole leg is broke, though. Keep walking. I'm trying. Go ahead. Can you advise what we're looking at here? Male, female, class breeding? Walk. No. Female, tail. No. Don't tell me that I have kids of my own, dude. Most parents can agree that bringing a child into this world is the biggest, most precious gift. But you have to make sacrifices and your children will always come first. Unfortunately, not everybody is born to be a fit parent and when a child's safety and well-being stop being the top priority, tragedy can happen. This is exactly what happened to little Victoria Martins. Her mother made terrible decisions and put her daughter in harm's way for selfish reasons. She was defenseless and Victoria paid with her life for her mother's carelessness. Welcome to Fear Files where we discuss and dissect the most mysterious, terrifying and mind-bending cases from all over the world. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you're a fan of our work. Also, hit that bell icon so you can be notified each time we post a chilling story. In this episode, we are going to talk about the brutal murder of Victoria Martins. Victoria was born on the 23rd of August 2006 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Her mother, Michelle Martins, was originally from the Bronx, New York, and moved to Texas before settling in Albuquerque. The identity of Victoria's biological father is not publicly known. Victoria also had a half-brother, Matthew, born in 2008. Thankfully, Matthew was with his father at the time of Victoria's death, so he survived. At the time of this crime, Victoria was living with her mom at the Arroyo Villas apartment complex in Albuquerque and attended elementary school. She was a happy child with a bright future, loved gymnastics and swimming and playing. Her favorite color was purple. She was a sweet little girl who was always smiling. The then 35-year-old Michelle Martins had been working her new job at the deli of Smith's Food and Drug, a branch of Kroger. She worked hard and she loved her children. She never drank alcohol or did any drugs up until this point and it is supported by the fact that Michelle passed the drug test employees had to take at her new workplace. She also did not have a criminal record in New Mexico. Unfortunately, this idyllic life took a dark turn when she met a man named David Hernandez. In March 2016, five months before the murder, Michelle called the Children, Youth and Families Department, or CYFD, also known as Child Protective Services in other states, to report that her boyfriend at the time, David Hernandez, had tried to kiss Victoria. She was only nine years old. Hernandez had a lengthy history of sexually abusing children, including his own family members. He had also been arrested for attempting to kidnap a four-year-old girl in 2013. Luckily, that little girl survived the incident. Her mom chased Hernandez down and crashed his car to stop him from kidnapping her child. However, he had never been charged for the sexual assaults and while he was arrested for the attempted kidnapping, the charges were dropped. We don't know if Michelle knew about his predatory behavior up until that point, but when she made a report about Hernandez trying to kiss her daughter, the CYFD didn't follow up because they said only attempting to kiss someone doesn't qualify as an assault. 
Michelle would call CYFD five times in 2016 before Victoria's murder. It is not known what exactly she reported each time, but the number of times she called should have been a red flag. However, no action was ever taken regarding these reports. CYFD would later conclude that after conducting an internal review, they followed protocol and sufficiently investigated each report and could find no proof that any abuse or neglect had occurred. Basically, the CYFD was lying, trying to make themselves look good after such a terrible act of negligence. But in the end, Michelle broke up with her boyfriend and kicked him out of her apartment. However, Michelle didn't exactly have a good taste in men. In July 2016, Michelle met 31-year-old Fabian Gonzalez on a dating website called Plenty of Fish. Fabian, who was a regular methamphetamine user, was also a repeat offender in New Mexico with a long criminal record. He had been charged with assault of his former girlfriend a few years back. He took a plea deal for that, in which he pleaded guilty to two misdemeanor charges and got two years probation. His record also included a felony child abuse charge, driving under the influence and resisting arrest. Gonzalez moved into Michelle's apartment very soon after they met. By the 10th of August, he was bringing his drug addict friends back to the apartment when Michelle was at work and the children were at school. He and his friends would just sit around the apartment doing meth and destroying things. Michelle was a very careless person in this sense, this was now her second boyfriend with a serious criminal record and sexual abuse charges that she let near her child. Her family didn't even know about this boyfriend because he, Fabian, asked Michelle not to tell anyone about their relationship. He had a lot to hide and now the grandparents had no idea that their grandchildren were exposed to such danger. Fabian Gonzalez's cousin, 31-year-old Jessica Kelly, had just been released from prison on the 15th of August. Jessica had a long criminal history. She was in and out of prison for the last 10 years for convictions like drug charges, conspiracy to commit rape, and she was a regular meth user like her cousin. After she was released from prison, Fabian took her in into Michelle's apartment. I can't emphasize enough that Michelle had been dating Fabian for about a month at this point and his cousin Jessica only moved in eight days before the murder took place. From now on, the timeline of events gets a little bit confusing. August 23rd, 2016 was little Victoria's 10th birthday. She talked with her grandparents on the phone telling them about how excited she was to be celebrated at school and spend the day with her friends. Jump to the next day, 24th of August, 4.30 in the morning. The police arrived at the apartment complex after receiving calls from the neighbors about disturbance and screams coming from Michelle's apartment. And the guy is at our door saying he got beat up too bad. Oh my god! What's happening? I was away too beat up. I'm sorry? Yeah. Is it a male or a female that he's fighting with? There's two. No, there's a... Who are you fighting? There's two in my house. Oh, there's a girl in the house. I don't know, but this girl's beating me really bad. There's a little girl inside the house. How old? How old is your daughter? Ten. ten. Oh, yeah, she's ten. Is she awake? I don't know. She doesn't know. It's the other individuals inside her house. Michelle and Fabian were outside the apartment. They had been in some kind of fight. Michelle had a deep wound on her face and Fabian had a cut above his left eye too, while Jessica remained inside the apartment. When the police called for her to come out, she bolted the door and jumped off the second floor apartment's balcony, fracturing her ankle. Come here, come no. here. Come here. I didn't do nothing. Come here. There's some, there's some shit that went down. No, I didn't do nothing. Hey, stop. In the video, police confront Kelly, who is limping after jumping off a balcony. Why'd you lock the door? Somebody just started a fire and I went over the 
APD officers were there initially that night after a call about a fire at the apartment where Victoria Martins lived with her mother, Michelle, and her mother's boyfriend, Fabian Gonzalez. What were you fighting about? She woke up and asked her daughter was. Uh -huh. I don't know where she's at, dude. Okay. No, we got her. She's in another apartment. Huh? Did you hit her? Did you hit her? Huh? Did you hit somebody? She hit me and I hit her back. As one officer talks to Kelly to get her side of the story, a couple of other officers go into the apartment, not knowing what they'll find. When they finally come out, their demeanor is changed. They seem upset. Hey, put it in your car, man. You're gonna My walk. Broken. I just got thrown off the balcony. You didn't get thrown off. You jumped off. I saw you close the door. The officers then get a call from dispatch. Can you advise what we're looking at here? Male, female, crying, screaming. Walk. No. Female, ten, female, no. Ten, female, ten, Before they reach the officer's car. Kelly tells them there was another person with her in the apartment. Who else was in the apartment with you? I, another guy. Uh, uh, I, I, oh. Where's the other guy? He took off. He, he started trying to wipe blood off. And they started panicking. Who's the other guy? Uh, I don't know his name. Was. They call him Lakota. But the police reprimanded the three, entered the apartment, and were met with a truly horrifying scene even the most experienced officer would find disturbing. There was smoke coming from the bathroom, so they went to investigate. Laying in the bathtub was the lifeless body of little 10-year-old Victoria. She had been dismembered, wrapped in a sheet, and set on fire. So the three perpetrators were taken to the police station to be questioned. Fabian's interrogation lasted for nine hours. The entire time he insisted he had nothing to do with the murder, while Jessica refused to be interviewed without her lawyer present. Michelle's questioning, though, revealed some very disturbing details. Michelle said that her daughter, Victoria, had been injected with meth to sedate her so that Fabian and Jessica could rape her a 10-year-old birthday girl. And Michelle watched as her boyfriend and his cousin raped, strangled, and dismembered her own daughter. Michelle also confessed that she had trafficked her daughter before. She found men on dating sites to come over and have sex with Victoria. It can't be emphasized enough that she was only 10 at this time. And her own mother allowed these things to happen. Or at least according to this confession. Everybody, even the detectives, believed Michelle's version of events to be the truth. It was a whole media frenzy. So they were detained and on the 8th of September 2016, the trio was indicted on charges of intentional abuse of a child, aggravated criminal sexual penetration, murder and tampering with evidence. Michelle's bail was set at $1.5 million, while Fabian's and Jessica's were set at $1 million each. However, building a case against Jessica and Fabian based on Michelle's confession was proving extremely difficult because according to DNA evidence and the results of Victoria's autopsy report, as well as phone records, pointed in a very different direction. It seemed as though Michelle was not saying the truth after all. In 2017, a new district attorney was appointed who investigated the case with a fresh pair of eyes. After a year and a half of analyzing DNA evidence, cell phone data and conducting numerous interviews with eyewitnesses, the DA came to find out that Victoria must have been killed between 7 and 8.45 p.m. when Michelle and Fabian were indeed not at home. They were in a house in South Valley, as their cell phone record showed, so there was no way that Michelle was present at the time that her daughter was killed. Furthermore, the DNA of a fourth person, an unknown man, was found on Victoria's back. Based on this fresh information, the police set up a new timeline of events. At 11.40 a.m., Fabian and Michelle went to a dealer's house to buy drugs while Victoria was at school. The dealer personally knew Jessica and warned the couple not to allow Jessica near Victoria anymore because she was high on meth and acting weird and could be a danger to the little girl. At 2.30 p.m., Fabian and Michelle go back home again, but they leave immediately after. 
Since the couple was busy out and about, someone needed to pick up the little girl at school. So at first, Michelle texted her mom, Victoria's grandmother, to do that favor. However, when the grandmother called her on the phone right back, Michelle ignored the call. So Fabian convinced Michelle to ask Jessica to pick up the girl at the bus stop. Michelle was concerned about that because now even a drug dealer warned them about Jessica as a potential threat in her drug haste state. In the end, the grandmother is told she should not pick up Victoria because someone else was going to do it. Fabian and Michelle were busy all day and at 3 p.m. they went to yet another person's house to do who knows what. While there, Michelle texted Jessica to pick up the little girl at the bus stop. In fact, she texted her twice, but Jessica never replied. It was exactly at 4.35 p.m. that Victoria is dropped off by the school bus and from there she somehow got home. It is unclear if she had to walk home or Jessica did pick her up in the end, but the point is she got home safe and sound. We know that because at 5 p.m. Michelle and Fabienne also got home and an hour later the little girl went to the gas station with Fabienne to pick up something. Here is the first alarming thing that happened. At 6 p.m. Jessica was talking on the phone with her sister who was also a drug user, seeing that she was tweaking and hallucinating. Tweaking means becoming excited from taking amphetamines or other drugs. So we know based on this that Jessica was getting high. It is particularly alarming because a few minutes later Victoria and Fabian arrived home from the gas station and right after that Fabian and Michelle left home to go to Paradise Hills yet again. But they get back home only half an hour later when little Victoria is seen alive for the last time. Bear with me because right after Fabian and Michelle returned from Paradise Hills, they left home again for the fourth time that day, leaving the defenseless girl with the drugged Jessica unsupervised and alone at home. We know that between 7 p.m. and 8.45 p.m. Michelle and Fabian are not at home as they were in South Valley, which is also the period that the coroner said as the time of Victoria's death. Then at 8.45 the pair finally pulled onto the driveway but didn't get out of the car right away because they were still listening to music. However, exactly at 8.48 Jessica is witnessed carrying the lifeless body of Victoria outside the apartment wrapped in a blanket. Just as Jessica was carrying Victoria's dead body, she noticed her cousin and his girlfriend sitting in the car listening to music. So Jessica turned right around and went back to the apartment, still carrying the body. Right then, Michelle and Fabian got out of the car and went up the stairs to their apartment. Upon entering, Jessica pulled her cousin aside and told him that Victoria was dead, but Michelle didn't hear this. The two decided to cover up the murder by cleaning up the crime scene and burying the body. So Fabian distracted Michelle by asking her to cook dinner, while Fabian and Jessica went to the other room to execute their plan. This part is extremely upsetting, so viewer discretion is advised. Fabian and Jessica cut off Victoria's arms with a knife. Fabian removed some of her organs. They then put those removed organs in a trash bag and cleaned up the blood. They then put Victoria's body in the bathtub. During this time, Michelle was already in bed, not realizing her daughter is dead. After the cleanup, Fabian joined her in bed. Some time passed by until suddenly Jessica came in and attacked them both with an iron and that is how the two got the ones on their faces that are visible in their mugshots. It is unknown how the two reacted to this attack and we also don't know if Michelle was still unaware of her daughter's death. 
soon after this, but not long before the police finally arrived at the scene at 4.30 a.m., Jessica removed all of the smoke detectors in the apartment. And while Fabian and Michelle left the apartment and waited outside, Jessica set fire to Victoria's body that was still in the bathtub. And from then on, you already know what happened. Victoria's body was taken for an autopsy that came back with the cause of death as strangulation. Furthermore, contrary to Michelle's first version of events, there were no traces of meth in little Victoria's body. She also wasn't raped, or at least not that day. Tragically, the autopsy showed that she had an STD, which is believed to be a result of a sexual assault that Michelle actually reported months before the murder. The question may arise, if Michelle knew of Victoria's rape and she reported it to the police, why did nobody do anything about it? Well, there is no more public information on that, but it is important to mention that there is no evidence that Michelle really trafficked her daughter, again, contrary to her first confession. So, why did Michelle make a false confession where she admitted to witnessing her daughter being raped, murdered, and having trafficked her previously? Why did the police just believe her version of events without investigating it? It is theorized that during her confession, she was being fed the answers the investigators expected from her. On the tape recordings, she often sounds like she isn't really aware of what she's saying or that she fully understood the consequences of her words. So, in 2018, when all of this new information surfaced, the investigators finally decided to make a psychological profiling of Michelle. It was determined that she was a very vulnerable person, a people pleaser, which explains why she allowed Fabian and Jessica to just live in her apartment rent-free and bring over drug users. Michelle's lawyer emphasized that she has a lower than normal IQ. She admitted to witnessing Victoria's murder without realizing that she was incriminating herself. So, after it was certain that Michelle's confession was false and she wasn't even present when Victoria was murdered, the murder charges against her were all dropped. She accepted a plea bargain and pled guilty to one count of reckless child abuse resulting in death and faces 12 to 15 years in prison. She is not innocent, but she is also not a murderer. She is definitely a bad, irresponsible mother who subjected her daughter to fatal danger because she was afraid of saying no. In January 2019, Jessica also accepted a plea deal. She pleaded no contest to six charges, including child abuse resulting in death, great bodily harm, aggravated assault, tampering with evidence, and conspiracy to commit tampering with evidence. She could serve up to 50 years in prison as a result of this plea, but all of the rape and murder charges against her were also dropped. As part of her plea agreement, she has agreed to testify against Fabian. Unlike Michelle and Jessica, Fabian didn't accept a plea deal and will go on trial. In the fall of 2018, the murder and rape charges against him were dropped and instead he was charged with reckless child abuse resulting in death and several counts of tampering with evidence. It is shocking that Fabian was released from prison in November of 2019, only three years after he was first detained. As of now, he is under house arrest waiting for his trial. The only reason why he was let out of prison is because his murder and rape charges were lessened to only reckless child abuse, which apparently isn't good enough of a reason to keep him behind bars in the meanwhile. I don't know about you, but I think complicity in covering up a crime scene and dismembering the body of a 10-year-old girl is a big enough of a danger to society. So, who could have been the fourth unknown man whose DNA was found on Victoria? Well, most likely Jessica knows who it is. Here is her version of that, but it is uncertain how trustworthy this woman really is. So, according to her, the night that Victoria was killed, a man came to the apartment asking for Fabian. Jessica told him that he wasn't home, only her and the little girl. 
So this mystery man entered the apartment just like that and killed Victoria as revenge for something drug or gang related. Now the foreign DNA was found on Victoria's back which could have come from skin contact, sweat or saliva. Until now it hasn't been matched to any samples in the central DNA database. The hunt for this unknown man is still ongoing. As for Victoria's grandparents, John and Pat Martins, they filed a lawsuit against the city of Albuquerque for not investigating the claims made by Michelle regarding her ex-boyfriend trying to kiss Victoria. The murder probably could have been prevented had authorities and child protective services always done their job properly. Unfortunately, this lawsuit was dismissed and as of now there is no new information about it. On the 29th of October 2016, a memorial service was held for little Victoria. More than 600 people attended, wearing purple, her favorite color. Each year on her birthday, which tragically is also the anniversary of her death, a memorial takes place. The crowd releases dozens of balloons and blows bubbles into the sky. After the sun goes down, attendees sing happy birthday in her memory. This was the story of the tragic death of little Victoria Martins. Tell us your take on this case down below and of course, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Also, don't forget to hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. And until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.